Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Shelly. I will share this screen. Uh, I hope you can see it now. It's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it works. Um, Go ahead. Perfect. So thank you very much again for the introduction and for the invitation possibility to participate in this um, photothermal webinar, uh, which is really a nice opportunity to meet other groups uh, working in this field. And I will um, uh, present a talk about uh, wide field photothermal imaging um, and some examples using vibrational uh, probes. But uh, yeah, since I'm pretty new in the field, let me just say a few words about uh, my group. Uh, which uh, I call like applied optics or applied laser spectroscopy group. And um, the core is that we uh, are interested in developing uh, new optical techniques based on laser spectroscopy. And we have so far uh, and still are uh, mostly focusing on quantitative analysis, fast analysis in situ in processes and mostly uh, cases, uh, species. And that can be everything uh, as Michelle mentioned, from uh, combustion and also gasification uh, diagnostics. Um, we are here interested in energy conversion, uh, I mean, to produce heat and power from biomass and waste, which are, uh, biomass is abundant, I mean, in, in, in Northern Sweden, um, but of course could be relevant for many other um, uh, areas uh, as well. Uh, gasification in order to produce maybe chemicals so here we analyze um, a lot of things in, in, in hot reactive uh, flows, like also temperature and major and trace species, or for example, potassium species, which are important for biomass. Another uh, field where I have quite some experience in is uh, breath gas analysis. Like when we exhale uh, breath, we can analyze trace species there that can say something about our health or metabolism. Uh, here, for example, you see uh, experimental data from one exhalation profile of CO and then fit it to a, a model for the physiological model of how this CO can end up in the in the exhaled air from the blood. So here we were interested in metabolism or um, oxidative stress and signaling on the macroscopic scale. Like if you take the whole body and see the output in terms of breath, and that can be done via uh, measuring ammonia, for example, or carbon uh, monoxide. Uh, and then we somehow got interested in understanding this process better, like how do we get these molecules uh, to the breath or to the blood in the first place? And here we got more interested in uh, going to the cellular level and started to think about chemical imaging. Uh, also here, again, looking at metabolism or energy storage and production. So in one way, uh, all of these, including combustion, all of these, uh, fields have the overarching, uh, I mean, theme of looking at how does fuel convert uh, how uh, in oxidative reactions, just on different scales and uh, time uh, scales also. Um, so our group is yeah a quite a small group, um, a few postdocs and PhDs working here, always uh, in average, three four people and. Um, for this work here, I would particularly uh, like to thank Eduardo Paiva, who did most of the uh, work or studies that I present uh, today. Then we are lucky that we have a, a very good um, chemical biological environment at UMI University, where we uh, have a lot of contact with other people working in life science and biology, for example. So here we uh, have our contact to um, to know what is interesting in lipid research, for example, or microorganisms like algae. So yeah, I thank also here my collaboration partners and of course the uh, funding sources. So our motivation, if we now go to uh, the chemical imaging is uh, to study relatively fast biological processes. And usually we think of biological processes as being relatively slow, uh, but there are some uh, uh, things that are ongoing on the level of um, time scale of seconds. And that can be uh, something like the uptake of fatty acids or lipids. So if you have a cell, like hopefully you see my cursor here, and you have free, uh, free fatty acids around it, then this uptake process through the membrane can be on the order of seconds. And then you have a little bit longer process of forming 
uh, lipid droplets often for energy storage. Um, and also how the dynamics looks like of this lipid droplets, like how they move, that can also be an indication of the state of, of cells. Uh, other examples, what could be interesting is just the uptake in general of substances uh, and the metabolism in microorganisms like algae uh, or spore germination, for example, which is quite heterogeneous and you have to be able to uh, monitor a larger um, congregation of um, spores and see when and how they germinate. Um, another point that is of interest is, of course, high throughput uh, analysis of, of samples that could be interesting for medical diagnostics like in, in routine uh, cases. So for all these applications, speed is, is important. Um, on the other end, of course, we usually also would like to have high space resolution and a good sensitivity. In life science, as we have heard here many times before, we have uh, many techniques around that uh, are established and used, like fluorescence and Raman spectroscopy. And all of them have, of course, their advantages and disadvantages. Um, IR absorption in general, um, due to the uh, strong absorption cross sections in the mid IR, you have a high chemical contrast and you can make it uh, relatively fast. Uh, but due to the diffraction limit, you lack the spatial resolution. So if we, yeah, Formula, uh, formulate a challenge here, then is of course, like usual to simultaneously achieve uh, the high sensitivity, but also speed and a wide field of view. Um, and for this, it has often been uh, proposed that uh, photothermal microscopy is a very good um, solution because we can hear uh, excite uh, specific molecules in the uh, infrared or mid IR region or far infrared maybe, um, which then leads to certain changes in the sample, like uh, sample will heat up locally, the refractive index will change and we can detect uh, these changes uh, uh, by other uh, light sources like lasers or LEDs uh, in the visible, uh, which then gives us the advantage of being limited by the diffraction limit based on the visible light and not the IR uh, light. That has been discussed before. Uh, it can be probably a fast reaction because many materials have microseconds relaxation times. Um, another in interesting point is of course that I have also better um, optics and uh, yeah, technology for detection in the, in the visible light of visible uh, wavelength range. Um, Another thing that has not been explored that much, only by a few groups, is that I can have a single detection system combined with several pump lasers. So I could, in principle, have multi-species detection here with the same um, camera, for example, or photo detector. Um, and we can uh, often advertise it to be able to do label-free imaging in the fingerprint region. But of course, we can also turn to vibrational probes, which may be advantages uh, in some uh, applications. So our focus uh, starting this, this work is uh, to uh, aim for high speed, but at the same time, wide field imaging. So we don't have to scan either the sample plate or the um, uh, focus on the, on the sample. Um, and we'd also like to see how far we can uh, push the limits with uh, using quantum cascade or external cavity quantum cascade lasers as pump laser, uh, because they are very useful and have a high brilliance um, uh, and, and often can cover quite a wide uh, wavelength range. Plus vibrational pro probes, as I will talk about today. Um, Vibrational probes, uh, of course, there are many types of probe, probes and in fluorescence, we attach fluorescent molecules, uh, but there are some vibrational probes that are very interesting because they have absorption lines in the cell cell and window, uh, about 1900 to 2600 inverse centimeters uh, here, uh, where we don't have absorption of the usual compounds that we find in, in cells and also water. Um, 
And as has been extensively done in the Raman spectroscopy, one can then choose small, uh, quite inert vibrational probes that do not disturb biological processes like the fluorescent uh, probes. Um, so yeah, and we at the moment have two lasers, one here in the cell cell region in, the, in a quite good uh, spot here, and then also one where we can do complementary uh, measurements in the fingerprint region. So which vibrational probes are here of interest? Um, well, uh, we looked specifically at those that have absorption lines in our wavelength range, like around 2,100 wave numbers. Um, and here we have alkene uh, probes. This we have shown in uh, one of our publications that one can successfully use that. And that's also the probe that is mostly used I think in Raman spectroscopy. Uh, then a very promising uh, probe is deuterium. Um, we can, um, and that has been shown also recently, just uh, an accepted paper by Joe's group in Korea and also in Cheng's group that has been shown before. Um, so that can be useful also in the sense that I can use uh, heavy water to uh, exchange the CH to the CD bond. Uh, so these possibilities we have. Uh, Acides in general could have a very strong absorption also, but there is not much uh, work on that with IR spectroscopy. Nitriles have been uh, used a little bit with IR spectroscopy also before. So there are quite some options uh, in this wavelength range. And what one can do with that is then of course to specifically target uh, molecules uh, with high specificity that I know exactly, okay, there we have those molecules that are tagged with these probes. So we, one could check how they are uptaken in cells uh, and track them. Um, or we can use, uh, we can incubate with uh, heavy water and see uh, where uh, this exchange uh, happens in cells. So this is a little bit for the uh, background. And we have, uh, in the beginning, like for our first setup that I present here, we have aimed for a quite um, simple setup where we have simply the IR pump um, and um, the probe here counter propagating um, in a transmission type of configuration, but we could of course change it also to reflection. We use an AOM to uh, modulate uh, a CW uh, pump laser here. And um, then we have used uh, lead most of the time uh, to uh, probe the changes uh, in the sample. And then we use either a photodetector or a high-speed camera, depending on uh, what we want to see. Um, so one problem here, of course, that arose was uh, how do we uh, really demodulate uh, a signal that we get from the camera. We have uh, a lot of pixels, maybe a million pixels. How do we do lock-in detection uh, for all those? There are solutions for that. Uh, the virtual lock-in has been around for a while and uh, works very well. In this work here, we wanted to first try a setup that avoids synchronization. We wanted to have something that kind of replicates like a photo detector detection, but with a camera. Um, so we opted here um, for such a digital frequency conversion, which is also routinely done in quite many uh, applications where we uh, collect uh, camera images with a um, high frame rate uh, for a certain time. And then we uh, do a Fourier transform and analyze the harmonics or extract the harmonics of our modulation free, uh, frequency only. Uh, from that signal. And then we convert it uh, back to the time domain and we define here the integrated signal as the uh, uh, phototermal signal. Um, this approach, I will talk later about that, has some advantages and of course also quite some limitations. Uh, but advantages are that we are independent of phase between the MIP signal and the reference signal and we have can use a continuous wave probe library, which in principle is interesting um, because we can just use it as such. We don't have to pulse it. 
<clears throat> and we uh, don't have to do the synchronization here. In addition, we can quite easily get uh, quite many harmonics here to analyze. That has also some advantages. And um, also we can get the decay curves uh, if they are not uh, too, um, if the decay is not too fast. So we characterize this system first on the Ferris unit particles. Um, if we do hyperspectral MEEP with the photodetector, we can see that we can get um, spectra that are uh, the same or similar to lock-in detection on FDIR. So this Ferris unit has also a very strong absorption in the cell side and uh, window here. And um, with this, we try to have a quite wide field of view, 130 times 130 micrometers. And we confirmed that we can get basically the same spectrum also with point measurements with the camera. Um, looking at the spatial resolution, even though we could have nominally obtained uh, around four or 500 nanometers resolution, we see that effectively we have, we had at least in that system a one micrometer uh, resolution only due to both blurring also the pixel size of the camera and probably our pump and probe um, um, conditions that we used here, parameters. Um, the signal to noise ratio is uh, follows basically the short noise, but here we, our short noise level is very high because we have a bright field detection. We collect a lot of kind of light uh, that is not the analytical signal. Um, and we can see that in principle, it can be quite fast here if we have the contrast. So up to uh, four or 5,000 images per second, we can detect. Uh, but later we see that in the uh, practical applications in cell measurements, then we uh, had issues with the sensitivity and we had to use one second integration time, although we had in principle uh, the speed there um, uh, for uh, uh, the frame rate or taking the images. Um, uh, Florian, uh, yep. about uh, three minutes left. Yes, okay. So, yeah, the photothermal decay curves we can detect. Um, that was very nice. And we have also seen that uh, the signal to noise ratio can be increased a factor of two, maybe by um, uh, detecting uh, several uh, harmonics at the same time. Then we have applied this system first to detect uh, palmitic acids or fatty acids tagged with an alkene probe. And that worked very well. We can see that we have a high contrast. We can see basically only this alkene palmitic acid uh, from the photothermal signal. And we overlay it here with the raw camera image and see that these were some lipid droplets that were built up in this um, uh, fibroblast 3D3 cell. Um, then we looked a little bit more into other vibrational probes. We did some basic uh, DFT calculations uh, to see just uh, uh, basic absorption spectra and the magnitude of response we can get here. And we see that the deteriorated um, palmitic acid uh, gives a quite much larger signal than see that the um, alkene palmitic acid here, um, or if we just zero it with uh, two. Uh, DC bonds. Uh, the acid probe here was not there, but we then confirmed these measurements by incubating uh, cells with these probes and did some FDR measurements. Here we see that also the uh, uh, deuterated palmitic acid gave the best uh, uh, response. So then we used uh, these deuterated acids to incubate three to three cells. Um, here we had to switch um, to uh, from the MSO solvent to the BSA, bovine serum albumin uh, solvent, to be able to get a bit higher concentrations of the uh, fatty acids into the cell. But we can see here, um, this is the uh, control here. And we can see that when we incubate it, we get a very good contrast. Uh, and we see these um, deteriorated fatty acids in, in this cell. And again, here we used one second um, integration time. Uh, another uh, application that we had to look at uh, D2O, heavy water uptake, like basically an um, 
hydrogen deuterium exchange process, um, also around these wavelengths in microalgae. And here we have the same situation we see uh, on the lower panels, we see the control where we did incubate only with water and then with heavy water, then we see uh, the CD bond of lipids uh, shining here in, in the algae. These are always uh, three, four algaes attached to each other. So we see it in the cell walls here, mostly as expected. So as a conclusion, we can say that this system um, is like a um, wide field heterodyne MIP, but with low frequency, we, because we are still limited here by the camera if we take kind of in the, the full, uh, uh, if we sample kind of the full signal. Um, and we could achieve this with this frequency domain uh, lock and filter. And we have shown that in principle, it can be used for live cell imaging of tagged uh, fatty acids uh, in the cell cell and window. Uh, and also uh, in, in, in microalgae when we have the HDX um, uh, exchange here. Uh, but we've also seen severe limitations. Uh, I have not shown all the victors, but if we use a lower concentration, then uh, we soon uh, end up having a signal lower than the noise. So uh, uh, it means that with this system, uh, this would work quite well for larger optics, so above one micrometer and maybe higher concentrations or solids. In order to improve this setup, if you want to go to lower concentrations and see maybe the onset of the uh, uptake of lipids, then we have to, uh, at least that's our idea now, probably go to the virtual lock-in approach and have a more efficient detection that we can really only get the photons uh, to the camera that come from the photothermal response. And with the, uh, for that, we will probably also use a look Korean laser so that we can have a strong uh, brilliance, uh, but uh, still, uh, and a high rotation rate, of course, for the pulses, but still um, uh, avoid the speckle noise in the wide field detection and shorter IR pulses if, if that's possible. Uh, unfortunately, higher uh, cameras with higher full well capacity, which would be very good for the signal to noise ratio, are of course very expensive. And I think some of those with the highest full well capacity are at the moment not um, available as we have seen. But yeah, that is uh, in principle what I wanted to present today. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Um, for questions, uh, you you may uh, raise your hand or, or maybe speak up simply if, uh, if I don't uh, see you. So I don't see, oh, the, uh, no, I don't see immediate questions. Maybe you can start with one. I. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, the, these different, uh, you know, um, chemical groups, uh, vibration uh, probes in the in yeah. silent regions, and you mentioned the alkynes. So a few uh, last uh, issue, I think it was uh, uh, Wei Min uh, who mentioned also this uh, similar series of compounds, you know, with variations on uh, isotopic uh, compositions mm -hmm. and even substituents. So do you do you also explore these kind of uh, are, are these probes, you know, of the same type or what, what are the advantages and disadvantages of these different chemical uh, tracers or tro probes, vibrational probes? You mean to use uh, vibrational probes? Yeah, uh, compared to what uh, we, uh, we, we heard last week. Isotope, yeah. I'm not sure if I had time to listen to that talk, but uh, uh, I think these are uh, I mean, essentially you might... when you in order to make as many colors as possible, so you can uh, tag different, uh, uh, different yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, biomolecules, uh, metabolites, etc. Because yes, those are that, small probes. So yes, we have I, we have not yet explored it, but that's a, that's a very good. Yeah, if you can use just a slight shift in the wavelength due to exactly. uh, isotopic, um, uh, if you change the composition, uh, I think that could be possible here as well. But we have not uh, tried okay. it yet. Mm. That's a very, of course, very exciting uh, very way good, because yeah. you know it's, instead of fluorescence, where you have a few colors, there yes. you have uh, tens of colors. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nice. Um, are there more questions? There's something in the chat. Yeah, press, uh, please. Oh, in the chat. I didn't open the chat. Um, yeah, there's Marcus Anton. So please ask your question directly. Uh, it's easier if you can. Okay. Yeah. Hello? Can, yeah. can you hear Hello? me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Um, yeah, you, you showed the uh, 2100 wave number bands. Yeah. And uh, you choose exactly that band because you're limited in the QL, uh, QCL bands. 
Yes, but uh, this QCL one could, in principle, uh, I think, select another wavelength range here. Uh, but for us, we choose this one because we knew that we have we have a lot of um, interesting yep. transitions there. But yeah, yeah, but it is possible to go to another region here. Yeah. Mm. And have you ever looked uh, at the A mind one or A mind two band? Usually, they are just blocked by the water absorption, and then yes, yes, it, it's a good benefit that you deuterate your samples, and with this you just shift the, the water absorption. So you have yeah. two benefits, actually. Uh, yes, e e exactly. Uh, that was uh, one reason. I mean, of course, uh, it is very good to have labor-free detection, of course, and that is, should, is also explored. But yeah, if we can avoid the water in that region, that's a very big uh, advantage, yeah. And have you ever tried to look at the amide one? Is there something, a hidden trick, just to get rid of the, the uh, water background? Or? No, due, due to the fact that we don't have a laser right now there, we haven't looked at it, but uh, <laughs> this is also one of our uh, goals, of course, because it is always good to have a complementary detection in yep. the amide one and two bands. Yeah, so we, we will try to do that. Yeah. Uh, thank you.